Come, Holy Spirit, come, continue to blow through this place that we may always be for each other a guide in becoming all that God would have us be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So first of all, Dan, thank you. This morning I want to explore the Old Testament lesson. And it was long, and you read it with such great care, that I think we kind of grasped the story. Thank you very much. You know, it raises for me some questions of our orientation as Christians to power, how we understand power and the use of power, both ourselves and the power that we give to others over us. You know, how we use power, influence, and wealth. Do we use what we have been given for ourselves or for others? Now, in the Old Testament lesson, King Ahab simply wants the vineyard that, be, that, that belongs to Naboth. <coughs> he just wants it for his vegetable garden because it's near his house. And he thinks that he can get what he wants. So he goes to Naboth, and he actually, I don't know, maybe by today's business standards, he makes a pretty good offer, doesn't he? He says, now Naboth, I am the king, and I want your land. And so I'll give you another vineyard that's at least as good. And if that isn't good enough, I'd be happy to pay you top dollar for your vineyard. And Naboth says, this is my ancestral land. No thank you, king. And Ahab, of course, goes home and takes to his bed, depressed, right? <laughs> um, his wife, the ever maligned in all later literature, Jezebel. When I say Jezebel, it doesn't make you think of someone that's trustworthy, right? Okay, Jezebel. So she comes in and says, oh, my dear, why are you, you know, what are you suffering from? And he says, basically, I'm depressed. And she says, why? And he said, well, I'm depressed because I want that land right next to mine that belongs to Naboth. And he said that he's not going to give it to me. So she says, oh, honey, you just sort of, you know, you stay here and recover and I'll take care of things. So, of course, she goes to his desk and she uses his seal, which would be the king's seal. And no one knows that it's her handwriting and not the king's. And she unbelievably sends this message from Ahab to the local authorities who are quite willing to cooperate with her in her plot. You know, the plot, we heard it twice because they did exactly as they were instructed in this letter from Jezebel that they thought was from Ahab. They brought Naboth to a celebration, put him at the head table, found, don't you love this word, two scoundrels to come and sit on either side of him who were ready at the, the appointed moment to accuse him of having offended God and the king and then suggesting that the punishment for such was to take him out and stone him to death which they did. So then Jezebel can go back to Ahab, who is still depressed and reclining on his bed, and say, you know that vineyard you wanted? Just get on up now, and you know, we don't have Naboth in the way, so just head on over there and claim it. So what, what happens, though, is that God interrupts this little plot, right? So God calls out to Elijah the Tishbite, it says, Elijah, you better get on over there. I want you to go meet Ahab over at Naboth's vineyard. And here's what I want you to say to him. I want you to tell Ahab that the jig is up, that he's been caught. He's been caught coveting prop the property of his neighbor. He's been caught, what's that one? Uh, bearing false witness against his neighbor, and he's been caught murdering three of the Ten Commandments. So, Elijah goes over, nails Ahab, and not only that, predicts Ahab's downfall. But don't you love that one that the 
where the blood, the dogs have licked up the blood of Naboth, they're going to lick up your blood. Sorry. <laughs> That's pretty fierce language, right? And believe it or not, if you follow the story through Kings, that's what happens. So, you know, now who here was a fan of The Sopranos, that HBO series in the 90s? So, you know, that was that wonderful family. They lived in northern New Jersey, you know, and they, um, <laughs> it was like this contemporary um, <clears throat> view of, modern day US mafia culture and they were just leading these ordinary lives and they had the same problems that we all have, trying to figure out how to raise teenagers and trying to figure out how to care for their aging parents and all that. With one exception, right? They rather regularly used killings as a way of accomplish their, accomplishing their goals and getting their own way, a way of consolidating and keeping their power. And they did these killings all under the rubric of, it's just business. Some of you may know that terrible story of the Congo about the Belgian King Leopold <laughs> from about 1880 until 1920. Um, he wanted, he was not a very powerful king, but was related to a lot of powerful kings and queens all over Europe. Uh, deeply insecure, he wanted a colony. And so he basically, using those who had explored the interior of Africa, he basically perpetrated a worldwide scam. He used his country's treasury and, the, and, and actual troops to go in and to facilitate the rubber trade in the Congo to the extent that 40 million people, half of the Congolese population at the time, in a vast area in the interior of, of Africa, were killed. They were killed wholesale, families, villages, women, children, everyone, just to claim land for the Belgian use. They were killed carrying cargo or building railroads and Eyewitnesses say that when a body would fall, they didn't even bury it. They just sort of pushed it aside and called up yet another slave to do the work. They were killed when the rubber trade became so lucrative. Uh, they, they called together tribal chiefs and sent villagers out into um, the wild to get the wild rubber before they were cultivating it. And they were told if they didn't come back with their quota that their, spouse, their wife or their children would be killed. And sometimes when they would come back with even three quarters of a basket full, they would therefore, they might be killed on the spot or maimed. Um, and the killings just went on and on. Our Jewish Christ and Christian heritage tells us gives us guidelines for an ethic, an ethic we share with our Muslim brothers and sisters and, with the, our, this, and are the same guidelines for behavior with all major religions. We are given, for example, the Ten Commandments that are designed to help us navigate life, to experience freedom, and to live in harmony in this world. We are called upon to examine our own hearts and to make decisions that come from an ethic that we are taught. Our ethics ask us to consider first the other, to serve others and not ourselves, to be willing to sacrifice for others, and if we take Jesus seriously at all, as an example, to be willing to die for another. Some of you may have heard this joke before, but it's worth repeating. There was this minister who noticed little Alex in the narthex of the church, and he was staring at this large plaque that hung in the narthex, and he st stood there and stared for a long time. And so the minister saw him there, so came up next to him and said, Hi, Alex. And he looked up and he said, Hi, how are you? And he said, the minister said, Fine. And Alex said, What's that? And this plaque had 
all these names listed there, and there was a, an American flag kind of sticking out on both sides of the, the plaque. And the minister said, gosh, Alex, it's the memorial to all the young men and women who died in the service. And Alex's eyes got really big, and he said, which one, the 8 or the 10 o'clock? <laughs> so that's a joke about a seven-year-old's understanding. But it's not a joke that in the church we might have a plaque that honors someone who chooses to serve in our nation and on behalf of us and to put others first, right? I was at an ordination yesterday for some deacons down in Virginia and I went down to this ordination and you know, it was a great celebration in a church for people who have decided to set aside um, a life of their, their life for service to the church. But not every one of us is gonna enter the military or necessarily choose you know, uh, a life in the church, but it doesn't mean that it's not on all of our hearts that we are called to be the best we can and to also sort of live within the bounds of our Christian ethics. So, you know, most of us, golly, haven't uh, been killing people in deepest, darkest Africa. Kind of, I shudder to think that that was going on a uh, 100 years ago, you know. Um, most of us probably, you know, haven't been making mob deals or killing anyone because we didn't get our own way. But all of us participate in this life as people of some privilege, of some power and some wealth, if we're honest about who we are. Even if it's just by virtue of being citizens of the most powerful country in the world we really do negotiate our lives from a position of power. And so for most of us, um, it, we, it's incumbent upon us to really think about how we deal with not only our own hearts, but others in the context of the power that we have been given. So it makes me wonder what this Old Testament story tells us about that. And here's what I think. I think it tells us that any day, with our power, influence, and money, and given the possibility of a tricky spouse like Jezebel, we could be in trouble for selling our own souls any day. It tells us that more often than not, we're not really Naboth in the story. We're not the ones who are being put upon. But we're the Ahab and Jezebels of the story. We're the ones with the power and influence and therefore in deep need of the voices like Elijah's and other prophets. And we need them to be among us so that we don't have to wait until we've now, till the dogs want to lick up our blood because we've made so many mistakes. We need to keep the voices of the prophets in our communities so that they, we can be challenged. We are the people who know we need to be challenged and to be held accountable for the lives we live and the people we affect. And then there is that lesson that there is a moral arc in the universe and that God's voice does find its way into the conversations that we have in our own heads and that we have with each other that are about how we live in this world. Yesterday I officiated at a wedding here with an old Anglophile who loved the 1928 Book of Common Prayer in the Episcopal Church. That was the sort of last change of the liturgy years ago. And so he cajoled me into doing his wedding service from the 1928 prayer book. And what I loved was in the charge that the, the, the priest usually makes to the couple in the very beginning, the question that is asked sort of like, you know, so here we are, we're all gathered and are you ready to do this, right? So here's what I said to them yesterday. I require, I, excuse me, I, yeah, I require and charge ye both as ye answer at the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed. 
And then I go on and ask them to confess if there's any reason they can't be married. Let me read that line again. As ye answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed. God will have God's way with us. Stephen told me a story. Oh no, he's sleeping in the back again. <laughs> He told me a story that he ran into this woman from New York. She told him about this certain construction guy with whom she had had recent dealings and how at the completion of her company's work, they sent him the final bill, which was for the final 30% of the cost, and he refused to pay. And the more she pressed, he finally said, well, sue me. And she and her company did not sue because they checked with their lawyers and they figured out that they would accrue more in lawyers' fees than they were likely to recover if the suit went forward. It may seem sometimes that those who's, who use threats force or even killing to succeed, that they succeed. But t the telling part of this story that we heard in the Old Testament today are the words from Elijah. Because you have sold yourself to do what is evil, and then God's judgment will come. Maybe Ahab, I wonder, honestly, if he weren't depressed because his life was so misordered that it not getting his own way over a vineyard, that it could throw him so off kilter that he took to his bed and didn't eat. Well, that may have been a warning sign that his soul was already in trouble. So the good news, I think, for us today is this, that our church is and should be a safe place for us to welcome prophets and folks who, who share um, a sense of looking at our lives with the possible judgment of how we live our lives and use our resources that it also should be a place where we are safe to actually examine our own misordered lives and to seek God's help and God's guidance within the community so that we can keep our own souls alive, alive and ourselves more pure. What do you think? Amen.